Welcome back from the break, everyone. I'm Barry Lydon, Vice President of Patient Engagement at Edwards Life Sciences, and I'll be moderating this session. We're excited about this discussion on artificial intelligence and bias from Dr. Eric Huang. Dr. Huang is the Director of Duke Forge and the Assistant Dean for Biomedical Informatics at the Duke University School of Medicine. Dr. Huang's research interests span applied machine learning, research provenance, and data infrastructure. His research projects include building data provenance tools funded by the NIH's Big Data to Knowledge program, applied machine learning applications, including deep care management, and interdisciplinary project with Duke Connected Care, Duke's Accountable Care Organization, and Calypso, a collaboration with the Department of Surgery, using machine language to predict surgical complications. As director of Duke Forge, Dr. Huang is building a data science culture and infrastructure across Duke University focused on actual health data science. Dr. Huang, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Barry, and thank you to the National Health Council for the opportunity to talk about this really important and I think very topical subject. Um, and so uh, I was asked to talk about whether artificial intelligence findings can be flawed due to bias. And I will tell you, bottom line up front, absolutely. So we can end the talk now. No, I'm, I'm joking. So uh, what I wanna do is give you all some tools to think about this as an issue. The answer is absolutely. Um, but I want to explain a little bit why that's the case. Um, uh, disclosures, I'm involved in three different startups, none of which I'm discussing in this talk. Uh, and really the way I'd like to start talking about things is to start actually with this New, York, New Yorker article from October of last year. Um, it's a fascinating article talking about GPT-2, which is one of these uh, transformers, one of these artificial intelligences that can create text that seems very real. Um, and so in this case, I show you a screenshot from the New Yorker's webpage where you can actually click on this button and GPT-2 will create this text for you. And, and I'll read it because I think it's important to just get a sense of, of what this has produced. Yet in our culture, writing itself is an instrument that we have often trained ourselves to perform or that we have learned to drive by going on a difficult run. Writing is as much a discipline as reading or exercising. Unlike those activities, it must be done to something, an idea, a story, a code, a musical phrase, a rigorous and detailed exercise of it is like trying to play a musical composition or organize a conversation, a lofty goal for the sumo wrestler. So this is, this is a really interesting product of artificial intelligence. And I, and I love that the New Yorker really embedded within the context of Miracle with New Yorker highfalutin text, um, a transformer, which is the kind of machine learning this is, uh, to create similar sounding text. Um, and I wanna explain a little bit more about what all this means. And, and just for convenience's sake, I will basically make the terms machine learning and artificial intelligence equivalent. We can quibble over the details and, and the fine semantics of those two phrases, but in, in basically um, normal vernacular, we often treat these two things as, as a similar thing. So I'll use those terms somewhat interchangeably. The other thing I also want to mention is Duke Forge was funded by the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation to actually uh, run a conference on algorithmic bias, which happened uh, late last year. And if you want to look at the white paper of the proceedings, I'll just Google algorithmic bias to forge and you should be able to find the PDF uh, proceedings of that article. And, and a lot of what I'm talking about are part of the conversation that we had during that conference. So we've talked about, okay, machine learning and artificial intelligence are essentially interchangeable terms in, in current jargon. What the heck is that? So this is a picture of the actual uh, architecture of the, of the artificial intelligence that created that interesting text in the New Yorker. And many of you will probably go, what the heck is this? This, this all is, is gibberish. So let me define this a little bit more finely. And I'm going to use a definition that dates back a couple decades from a well-known computer, computer scientist, Tom Mitchell from Carnegie Mellon. And the way he phrased it is this, a computer program is said to learn from experience E 
with regards to some task T and some performance measure P, if it's performance on T as measured by P improves with experience. So I don't know if I've helped you all with this definition. So let's even unpack this a little bit further. Um, if we look at a Labrador retriever, and let's say you're trying to train your hunting dog and you have a bunch of these dummy ducks, you throw them out there, your laboratory, Labrador retriever learns to go retrieve them and bring them back to you. That you, what you're doing is you're, you're giving this Labrador retriever that experience E. So the experience E for the Labrador is you throwing dummies out there and the dog going out and grabbing them for you. Um, and then the task T is that actual task, right? It's the actual task of retrieving something. I got muted, so I had to unmute myself here. Uh, the goal is that um, you are basically rewarding your retriever based on his or her performance, and you, you might feed a kibble or something like that. So there's a reward for good performance. And, and really, the way we train machine learning models is, is really not that different. So when we do that, um, and we go through this definition of machine learning, let's talk about experience E with regards to that New Yorker article. So in that New Yorker article, this language model was trained from texts from the internet that were outlinked from Reddit. And for those of you who don't know, Reddit is essentially this big, somewhat uh, unwieldy and chaotic uh, internet bulletin board. And basically people can um, say they like uh, a text that's outlinked from Reddit and they can give it a karma point by clicking on a button. So the corpus of language that this New Yorker, uh, the, the, that this artificial intelligence that the New Yorker article talks about, uh, learn from is basically internet texts that were linked from Reddit. Past T, as actually defined by the people who generated this artificial intelligence, and that's this group called OpenAI, is quote, the ability to generate conditional synthetic text samples of unprecedented quality where we prime the model with an input and have it generate a lengthy continuation. So what you can do with the, this text generator is you can feed it a phrase and it'll riff off of what you fed it, essentially creating this synthetic text sample based on all the things that it learned from those Reddit uh, linked texts. And the performance measure P, I won't go into the math of it, is essentially the information content of that synthetic text. So in other words, does that synthetic text appear ordered and structured like human written text? So that was the way they defined it. So here's our text. And another way to sort of think about this is we have Reddit, which is the, the experience E, the training data from which this text uh, was generated. Uh, those equations down there represent the training process. So the, the basically the reward, uh, task that it's been given, just like us hand, handing the kibble to the Labrador retriever, the training promotes some sense of structure within that text. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what these mean, but I do want to divert a little bit into some of the temptations that we have with artificial intelligence. So one is, most people think, well, it's a computer doing it. So this this must have some objectivity to it, right? Because this computer doesn't have, you know, any biases of its own. It's, it's, it should be objective. So that's one temptation. The other temptation is that there's this sense of autonomy that thing like this has, right? So you feed a little bit of trigger text into this transformer and it generates a, a whole paragraph of very fluent sounding text. It may be a little bit odd, but it is fluent sounding. So there's this, there's autonomy to it. And, and certainly for uh, those of you who drive a Tesla, for example, there's this autopilot feature and there's a temptation just to sort of take your hands off the wheel and let it drive. It's, it's sort of freaky and sort of interesting and, and magical. We know that there have been some bad outcomes because of that. So that's certainly one of the other temptations that I think we associate with artificial intelligence. Now, what are the outcomes of, of situations like this? So a couple of years ago, uh, Microsoft created a chatbot, which had an artificial intelligence logic behind it. And they la launched this chatbot out on Twitter. 
Um, and they launched it with great fanfare. And the, the goal of this was that it was going to learn from how people tweeted back to it. So the experience E that it was gaining was just this, the willy nilly, you know, uh, of, of Twitter conversations. Um, you may know the outcome of that is that Microsoft ended up having to take down Tay, this chatbot, because as probably we unfortunately you now expect from many social media outlets, uh, a lot of people started feeding Tay a lot of, you know, pretty, you know, horrible things. And what transpired as, as Tay learned from experience E and the reward mechanism for Tay was just to have you know, basically people talk back to it, was that we essentially trained a neo-Nazi sex bot. Uh, and obviously Microsoft was obligated to take it down. So here's a case where we have data, which was all the tweets coming back to Tay on Twitter. Uh, and we have a situation where we have literally garbage in, garbage out. The other component about it is the reward mechanism for Tay to learn and to continue conversing with the public out on Twitter was that, sure, there's some math around it. And, and Tay could speak back to people in sentences that look like they came from a human. But with all that math, there's nothing normative about it, right? There's no moral universe behind uh, Tway's, uh, Tay's chatting. Hence, it turned into this horrific uh, chatbot spewing out garbage. And one thing that really alerts us to is that uh, machine learning is, is far from objective. Artificial intelligence learns biases. A really well-known researcher at the MIT Media Lab, Joy Willowman-Weeney, has actually published work that shows that systems built by many of the big tech vendors, Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, and others, uh, were unable to classify darker female faces as accurately as those of white men, right? And, and, and all of us can implicitly understand, most likely, they had trained most of their data. So that experience E was mostly on white men. Uh, hence, its performance for darker female faces was, was not nearly as good as it would be uh, in a white male Caucasian population. Getting more to the life sciences and, and the healthcare field, uh, this paper in Science just um, a year ago as well, uh, identified an algorithm by a large insurance payer, uh, which was biased as well. And, and, and this bias was not intentional, uh, but it was, and it was, in fact, there was, attempts to avoid the bias by not using race as one of the uh, informative variables in the training sets. So what the group building this algorithm did was they built their model on utilization of healthcare services, thinking that that was blind to race. But the outcome is actually that it was, it was biased. So the quote from this paper when they are analyzing this algorithm was that Bias occurs because the algorithm uses health costs as a proxy for health needs. And that health cost proxy is actually biased as well. And, and what's salient from these figures is the yellow lines are uh, for Caucasians. The purple lines are for African-Americans. And on the y-axis is some measure of some disease state. Um, and on the x-axis is the algorithm's risk score. So the higher the risk score, in theory, uh, the more likely this particular patient would need, let's say, complex case management services. But if you look at these graphs, you can see that there's significant deviation between the yellow and purple lines. So this risk score was calibrated for a white population. So if their threshold, let's say, uh, in this case, their high threshold for complex case management was something like 97 on the algorithm risk score, if we're looking at blood pressure, for example, in the upper left corner. So for a Caucasian person, the burden of disease is measured by uncontrolled blood pressure is, is significantly, is calibrated in a completely different range than it is for African Americans. So for an African American with equivalent burden of disease, really the risk score 
threshold should be set around, in this case, around 50. So that shows how miscalibrated this algorithm was and how it leads to differential treatment of people based on ethnicity or race. So where do these biases come from? And I'm going to cite another paper, I think dating for about uh, a quarter of a century ago, that actually unpacks the potential sources of biases in computer systems. And this is even preceding many of our concepts about artificial intelligence and machine learning, but it was quite prescient. And so the way uh, this group, Friedman and Nussenbaum, uh, categorize things is uh, three types of bias. So let's start with pre-existing bias. The way they define pre-existing bias is that it has its roots in social institutions, practices, and attitudes, and that these computer systems can actually embody these biases, uh, and even if these biases existed prior to the creation of the system. So that's one sort of bias, pre-existing bias. Another source of bias is technical bias. Um, and what that means is that there are aspects of the design process, including the limitations of the tools, or let's say the, the math around um, the performance of a tool that could be called technical bias. And finally, there's emergent bias in that once you've built that system uh, and you've launched it out into real world, there could be things about the world that change that actually can elicit bias from that system even after it's been launched. And in this case, you can, the way you can imagine it is, if you've built an algorithm for, let's say a certain population, let's say a hospital built an algorithm around their catchment area, and their catchment area has very distinct uh, socio-demographic characteristics to it. Let's say that hospital merges with another health system, which has a very different uh, set of patients with very different socio-demographic characteristics. That algorithm will not perform in the same way on that new uh, population of patients. So that would be a case of emergent bias. So the way they talk about bias is that versus an individual human, because many people, when we have this conversation, say, well, individual humans are biased. Um, and that's true. But when you're starting to talk about computer systems, what, you, what happens is that those computer systems can disseminate bias in an extremely inexpensive and an efficient way. So they have a much higher potential for widespread impact than the individual biases of humans. We obviously have to resolve bias on all levels, but there's nothing about computer systems that makes them less subjective. In fact, it's arguably in some ways they can scale bias much more rapidly than individual human beings can. And one point they make, again, this is a very prescient paper, is quote, unlike in our dealings with biased individuals with whom a potential victim can negotiate, bias systems offer no equivalent means for appeal. And, and that certainly is a problem. That automation component is nice and in some cases magical if you're using autopilot in a in an autonomous vehicle, for instance, for example, but there's no ability to negotiate with that system in a, in a realistic way that we can with human beings. Um, so the other component to thinking about bias and the other set of tools in one's tool set to talk about bias are, are how you quantify it. So in clinical research, we have lots of these metrics and lots of these metrics are based around something called a confusion metrics, a matrix. So if you look at this box, you have uh, the machine learning algorithms predicted uh, status. In, in this case, it's just a no, yes, no status versus the true yes, no status. And we have our true negatives, our true positives, false positives, false negatives. These are all things we think a lot about, especially in the diagnostic space in, in biomedicine. And what uh, experts in the quantification of bias talk a lot about is parity in these kinds of metrics. And so as you inevitably know, there are many different kinds of metrics that are associated with this confusion matrix. There's accuracy, there's precision, true positive, false positive rates, positive predictive value, negative predictive value. One basically can have a parity metric for all these different metrics. Um, and so there are dozens of them around. Um, but one thing that they don't help us with is the actual social consequences of that bias. Um, and one thing that I'll say, and I'm essentially repeating myself, is that algorithms 
don't have ethics or morals. Humans do. And that this article from ProPublica really articulates this really well. So ProPublica did a, a great series on this algorithm that's used to predict criminal recidivism. And what they identified is that this algorithm has a high false positive rate for African Americans and a high false negative rate for Caucasian Americans. And what we see here is, a, is an example. So this young lady, Brisha Borden, she's predicted to have a higher risk of criminal recidivism than this Caucasian man, Vernon Prater. His risk is three, hers is eight. If you look at their prior records, uh, Brisha Borden has four juvenile misdemeanors um, and subsequent to this prediction being made, she has no subsequent offenses. Whereas Vernon Prater, who has two armed robberies, an attempted armed robbery uh, with a lower risk score, ultimately had a subsequent grand theft. Uh, so clearly in this case, this algorithm is operating in a biased way. It doesn't meet any of the metrics that I alluded to, but the other component of it is why are we letting this algorithm operate in actual judicial systems in, in certain states in this country? So how do we fix this problem? There, there are ways one can address um, data collection, for instance. So we know that it's important for the sample that's used to train an algorithm to have a distribution that matches the real world. So there are things we can certainly do to improve our data collection. And, and this is a problem that everyone faces. And what is a truly representative population? And can one anticipate the population in which one uses an algorithm? These are things you can do in addre you know, by addressing the data collection problem. Another factor is, is math, right? So in this case, looking back at this um, algorithm that I talked about in the science paper, one can certainly do the math to, uh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Um, one can certainly do the math to adjust these lines so that they fit closely to get together. But I'll be honest with you, I don't find that particularly satisfying because there's, there's some issues that arise with that. Um, this is from a researcher at Carnegie Mellon talking about how you can do fair representations in an in artificial intelligence and, and, and methods to create fair representations. But one of the conclusions, and I'll translate this in a second, um, is quote, when the base rates differ across groups, any fair classifier satisfying statistical parity has to incur an error, depending on the difference of base rates on at least one of the groups. And to translate that is, if you take a large population and it has subpopulations that are defined by some sensitive variable, let's say it's, it's race, gender, ethnicity, whatever, and the rate of what you're trying to predict is different in those subpopulations, a fair classifier that tra treats each subpopulation equally will actually incur a predicted performance penalty on at least one subpopulation. Sub so the problem is even if we do the math to try to make things more fair, we still lose something uh, by doing that. So what are other ways to think about fixing things? Well, in Europe or in the European Union, they have GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. And as part of the policy defined by GDPR, there's a concept of right to explanation. So what they essentially say in the GDPR code is that if one is using an algorithm to, to do something uh, with a person in, in the EU, they have a right to an explanation about how that algorithm works. So that's an attempt to provide some transparency into algorithms and give people an appeal route if an algorithm does something that may be adverse to their interests. In the United States, we have no policy. Uh, there are examples that might be um, heralds of what we could do. Uh, the Genetics uh, Information Non-Discriminatory Act has a policy that talks about the misuse of genetic data, but we don't have, um, other than to some degree in the new California legislation, the equivalent of GDPR's right to explanation. Um, and then even if we talk about explanation, what does explainability really mean? So here's a sample of code that goes into one of these artificial intelligence algorithms. Uh, I would challenge most lay people, you know, 
to understand what this means. And I'll be honest with you, even if you talk to a computer scientist, uh, they can't even tell you exactly what this means in many ways. We, we can teach a computer to do things, but actually the, how the computer does that is often still quite difficult to explain. So how do we resolve this issue? Um, and, and, and there's no easy solutions, I'll be honest with you. But I, what I do think is, one of the key things is what I call is vigilance. So this image is an image I adapted from draft guidance from the Food and Drug Administration on how they're thinking about algorithms. Um, and the way the FDA thinks about algorithms is they think of them as software as a medical device. And I won't go into the, all the gritty details um, of this chart, but what they're really trying to do is to promote a lot of the same concepts they use in, in drug development and drug manufacturing in terms of good X practices. So in this case, it's good machine learning practices. So there's a whole life cycle around machine learning training, validation, and deployment. And the Food and Drug Administration is trying to basically capture all those elements of that life cycle so that we can actually promote uh, good practices uh, in terms of building and deploying algorithms. And what I would say is the important part of this is attentiveness to the consequences of machine learning. One thing that the FDA is really promoting, and they're promoting it in this program called the pre-certification program for these kinds of algorithms, is a culture of quality and organizational excellence. Now that's obviously not very hard to sort of pin objectively. Uh, it's one of those things where you know it when you see it, and we will need to develop community standards around what that culture of quality and organizational excellence is for groups that are building algorithms. But I think key too is that we constantly model, uh, monitor models, right? Once you deploy an algorithm out into the real world, like Microsoft's chatbot, you need to monitor it on a regular basis, if not continually, and look at its real world performance. Because no matter how well-intentioned the algorithm generator is, as I mentioned, the math shows that it's gonna treat subpopulations in a differential way. Maybe sometimes better, but sometimes worse. And we should pay attention to that because there's no way we can anticipate that in the real world. So there must be a real world continuous quality improvement approach to doing these kinds of things. Uh, my favorite philosopher in the world of data science is Ben Parker, uh, who is uh, Spider-Man's uncle. And he's famously known for saying, with great power comes great responsibility. And I, I really think that holds true in the world of data science and machine learning and artificial intelligence. And one of our approaches to addressing this really important responsibility is to actually engage with our patients. We uh, have really promoted the concept of creating patient and community advisory boards. And Duke Forge actually held its first one uh, just about six weeks ago, and, and we are continuously holding these as well, because I think it's important for us to not paternalistically address this issue, but to really engage with the people who these algorithms may actually directly impact and, and hear their thoughts about that. The other thing that I wanna say about this is that I train clinically as, as a surgeon. And I really think of artificial intelligence as no different than a surgical device in that it's an extension of at least my human capabilities as a surgeon, right? You know, this is a tissue sealing device. Uh, in many cases, this, this kind of device has revolutionized our approach to doing surgery because it allows us to seal vesicles where in the old days we would have to sew them closed or, or clamp them or whatever. Um, this is an incredible extension of our human capabilities, but we still are the surgeon. We are still responsible once we enter uh, the body cavity. And I think what that means is that these instruments don't obviate and can never assume our professional res responsibilities as trained clinicians. And I think that's important. Uh, you know, as part of medical training, we recite the Hippocratic Oath, we go through ceremonial processes, we go through um, in-person, on the wards type training uh, opportunities, and that's part of our professional code. Um, and I think that's important to really think about what is the professional code we should build around 
building algorithms that are going to have true patient impact. Um, I have here a picture of the Boeing 737 MAX 8. And I, I, the reason I put this picture here is it highlights what I call the dangers of reductionism. So as many of you know, uh, the reason why the 737 MAX 8 um, has such a tragic story is that there was an algorithm that was built into the plane called the MCAS, Quivering Characteristics Augmentation System. And Boeing, in conjunction with the FAA, actually concluded when they were marketing the 737 MAX 8 that the pilots didn't even, didn't even need to know that that algorithm was in the cockpit. So in many ways, they were saying that the algorithm supersedes the pilot in, in the conduct of flying this plane. And we know the results of that. So Boeing convinced itself, and this is to quote the New York Times, that there's no need to even introduce MCAS to the airplane's future pilots. When the first Indonesian Air 737 MAX 8 crashed, the pilots had no idea what was going on. They had no idea why the system was pushing the nose of their plane down. What we really need to do is thinking about not the algorithm being better than the pilot, or the algorithm being better than the radiologist or the pathologist or the surgeon. But what we really need to do is thinking about the algorithm working in conjunction with that professional. Uh, I think that's really a key to our approach to using artificial intelligence in the world, especially in the life sciences and in healthcare, in that we really can never absolve uh, ourselves of the professional obligations of a trained professional. And algorithms really need to function in conjunction with that professional because algorithms don't have judgment. So the, I focus on the plus there, obviously. So here's some conclusions I have about algorithms. One, algorithms are amoral. They're no better nor worse than we are at addressing bias. That's our job. There are dozens of fairness metrics one can use, but that doesn't mean that we can just use math to solve our problem. That does not obviate our, us of our professional responsibilities or our societal responsibilities to resolve bias issues. In medicine, we have professional codes and expectations. In clinical research, we have professional regulatory expect expectations. Do we really need the same for data science? One thing I've proposed for data science training programs at Duke, as, especially as they relate to healthcare, is whether these data science trainees should do clinical rotations just like we do as clinicians. I, I actually think that's something we should seriously think about. Um, and finally, I, I part with this note. This was a, a New York Times article from a few years ago talking about that same algorithm used in ProPublica, and I think it's a useful quote. Computers may be intelligent, but they are not wise. Everything they know, we taught them, and we taught them our biases. They're not going to unlearn them without transparency and corrective actions by humans. And I think that's the key parting shot that I have for this discussion about algorithms and bias. So I'd like to acknowledge the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for funding our conference. Uh, and these are a list of people who were instrumental in that conference. Uh, Rob Califf, my former boss, previous director of Duke Forge. And uh, there's my email address if you want to email any questions directly to me. Thank you. Well, Dr. Hang, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I think it's really, uh, really interesting some of the benefits and challenges that we are facing in the use of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and I'm wondering, I know in our company at Edwards Life Sciences, we've used algorithms to program monitoring equipment to be able to help clinicians, provide clinicians with information so that they can react. So there's a human in the loop there, yep. um, but we've, we've contemplated, you know, removing that human uh, because right. after years and years of, of testing it, the loop works without necessarily the human in that loop. But it sounds a little bit like you would recommend that that's not such a wise move. Maybe when it, it's with, uh, when we're talking about uh, actual health decisions and interaction as like a surgeon, like yourself, then maybe that's, or flying a plane, maybe that's a bad idea, at least for now. But 
What do you think about in terms of maybe other kinds of applications of, ar of artificial intelligence, like trying to uh, learn from an audience or learn from a community and using methods to be able to monitor, let's say, a discussion of patients so that they can learn really what's important to patients and, what, and what's not. Um, I think artificial intelligence in a lot of our minds is thought of as a way to make things easier. But what I got from your presentation is not to make it easier, it's to make it better. And I'm wondering if you have any suggestions on ways to look at how artificial, artificial intelligence can be applied to make sure that it's applied in the right cir circumstances in the right way. Right. I mean, and, and you know, I know it's implicit to say that the human should always be in the loop. I, you know, we wouldn't want an implantable cardiac defibrillator to actually have to request from a human the, whether they need to shock someone, for example. So there are definitely use cases that are very discreet. Um, and in that case, you know, I don't think we have huge concerns, let's say, about a, a cardiac defibrillator in this case in terms of bias. So I, I think we need to always pay attention to the context in which a decision is being made. So definitely in this case, in the cases that I talk about, they're more focused on the diagnostic space, right? And, and that's where bias can actually have huge potential effects. And I do think that diagnosis, the way we're taught as clinicians is that we always contextualize our patients in some way, right? Because there's no single measure that captures everything about our patients. So if we're looking at an MRI, and we see, let's say, a hepatocellular carcinoma on it, the radiologist is still obligated to look at the entire set of films and identify other potential findings. So where we might train an algorithm to identify hepatocellular carcinoma exquisitely well, it might miss other incidental findings that might have true you know, health effects on the patient. So I, I do think contextualizing the, the, where we're making decisions is important to identify the cases where humans should always be in the loop. And, and definitely I, I biased my uh, examples towards those situations where I feel that a human should be in the loop. Uh, you allude to what are other potential applications of using machine learning. I do think, you know, there's a lot of talk about ambient, you know, artificial intelligence where let's say you can have some Alexa type device sitting in, uh, let's say an exam room and listening to a doctor's conversation with a patient. In that case, what it's really doing is recording that conversation in some way. Now it's not recording it in the old fashioned way, like on a magnetic tape, it's recording it digitally. It's also using natural long language processing tools to basically make that conversation between the doctor and the patient more readily parsable and, and, and interpretable. Now the, the, where, I, where I see where we need to pay attention to is if you build an algorithm to interpret the conversation, you start treading into potentially dangerous territory. If you're using machine learning just to basically create a much more efficient way of doing data entry, that's probably, that's probably much less of a potentially risky enterprise. Um, but you know, I, the way that where I've seen that actually being implemented is there's always a human approval process as well, right? So that a clinician would say, okay, you've captured my interaction with this patient sufficiently well. I sign off on that, right? Don't let the, don't let the algorithm just decide it's, it's, it's okay and it's, it's read the interpretation appropriately. You still, I think, have to put a professional in the loop again because there are other contextual things that are outside of that clinic room that the machine learning algorithm doesn't know. Let's say if there are issues related to social determinants of health, that may figure into the conversation between a clinician and a patient to some degree, but there's no way that the, the machine has a comprehensive understanding of all those aspects around that patient. Fair enough. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation, a patient advisory group. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, what their role is, do they get training, and what kind of benefits have their contributions provided? So um, initially, you know, this is still early days. It's more giving both us awareness and the patient's awareness. So uh, what we've done is we have a patient advisory council that was assembled by our Clinical and Translational Science Award Institute, the, our CTSI. And they've gathered a, a, a group of uh, representative patients from our community. And we just had a conversation with them because this is new. Um, so I, in many ways, I spent um, time discussing the same things I've discussed with this audience in terms of what's machine learning, what's an algorithm, what are examples of how algorithms are used out in the real world. Let's say when Google recommends that you, you choose a certain pizza place, but you know, when you do a Google search, 
And then we, I actually deliberately opened up that discussion and say, okay, you know, what this means is for us to train this algorithm, it needs to have access to a lot of data. Um, so we discussed privacy issues too, which we, are not, we haven't talked about in, in this talk. But, you know, anytime you use machine learning, since it requires so much data, you, I think it's inevitable that we have this discussion about privacy as well. So what we got was a great dialogue between us and the patients. They, it's, it's sort of interesting because obviously you can imagine there's a whole gradient of uh, attitudes about things where some people is like, if this, is, if this algorithm is going to help me, um, and we're, this was uh, talking about an algorithm that we use in our Medicare population, they said, we're, we're okay with it. We just want to know. And I think that's the key is that um, people are, are more comfortable about things if there's transparency involved. So really the, a large part of the intent of the patient advisory council is just to be transparent about what we're doing um, so that they understand it's like, we're, we're trying to use this data to help take better care of our community. Our intentions are good, but we also want you to know what we're doing so that you can check us you know, if, if you feel uncomfortable with something that we're doing. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, that's a really great example of including patients as a part of it and to provide us all guidance on how to do things safely and ethically. Um, so uh, the questions are coming in so fast that I'm losing. There they go. So as a part of continuous quality improvement, would a common AI baseline contribute to reducing or eliminating bias? And, or could it make a difference? Um, that's an interesting question. So um, there's a whole field of machine learning, which is actually quite hot right now, called transfer learning. And um, probably actually many of you have encountered transfer learning to some degree. So the way Google does image uh, recognition is there's, there's a well-known Google what they call a pre-trained neural network called Inception. And I forget which version it is now. Um, many people have adapted Google's pre-trained model to perform other tasks. So many of you may be familiar with the JAMA article from a couple of years ago where Google is using uh, artificial intelligence to identify people with what they call referable diabetic retinopathy. Um, they actually used Inception sort of as the base model and then they basically, it's sort of like you get your Labrador retriever who has sort of generic capabilities, but then you train that retriever, let's say to be uh, a guide dog or something like that, as opposed to, you know, retrieving ducks or something like that. So what you have is you already have a network that has the capability, and then you add a different layer of training on top of it so that it can be more tuned to do some specific, specific task. So, um, so the reason I bring that up is that I do think that that transfer learning component where you just train it more specifically for something can be part of the way we think about continuous quality improvement is that you've trained your model. It, the model's good at what, it, what you trained it to do, at least initially. Let's say you identify biases and you, you really want to retrain the model to address a different subpopulation in a better way. Yes, that can be part of your approach to doing that. And you might have different versions of the model that let's say you use in different uh, subpopulations. That's certainly something that one can think about. Yeah, Loda actually responded in the ch chat here um, with a really interesting point that I would be interested in your perspective as a surgeon. Um, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit. There are biases in everything that we do. There were biases before the computer. Yeah. And the people making decisions about the, some of these big decisions about whether or not to allow access to certain kinds of therapies or which patients to treat or whether or not to even inform your patient of, a, of an option is right. potentially influenced by bias. So what do you, what's your thought on like how concerned should we be about bias? And if it's already right. there, this right. is just taking it and reinforcing it somehow. Is that such a bad thing given that's what we're living with in status quo? So uh, very good question, it, you know, probably highly philosophical because, you know, I, I mean, the, the analogy that came to me is like, when you go in the operating room, it's like, you know, you, you know, are you truly sterile, right? And, you know, we do our best to maintain sterility, but I mean, a surgical mask is not perfect in terms of, you know, stopping everything, um, but we, we strive for sterility. And I think that's the difference is that, um, you know, and, and, you know, as humans, we're not perfect. But 
I guess our hope is that we strive for perfection. And then absolutely, without a doubt, every action that we perform in society probably has bias in it. Every one of us has some component of that. But that doesn't mean that we don't try to be better. Um, and the, pro the worry I have with algorithms is they don't know to try to be better. They, tr you know, we give them a very discreet thing to accomplish. They accomplish it really well, but they don't have, again, the larger sort of viewpoint of society and thinking about what are, you know, I've accomplished this particular task. You know, it's sort of like the way people, we talk about people teach to the test. Basically, algorithms learn to exactly to, to perform as well as they possibly can to the test. But the test, you know, just like the SAT is not representative of our kids, you know, future performance, it's something we can use, but it's, it's far from perfect from that standpoint. And we try to, we don't admit people to college just based on their SAT. We admit them to college based on their interviews, their essays, et cetera. So um, I don't, you know, there's no perfect answer for this, right? But everything we do is imperfect. The algorithms we generate are imperfect. But I do think that the risk that algorithms can scale much more rapidly than than individual humans can because you know one person's biases might offset another person's biases sort of in total with an algorithm like the algorithm that we built for our medicare population hits 54,000 patients on a monthly basis that's that's a scale that you know an individual clinician can never achieve so i do think that means that we have to be much more vigilant with algorithms um, because it, just that ability and i think the, the ability, let's say, of uh, Facebook and, and other social media outlets to really propagate information out into the public at a scale that was that's unprecedented compared to the days when we just had, you know, physical newspapers. I think that proves that point. Yeah, that's a great point. And also, by the way, I just want to clarify, Loda wasn't suggesting the point. I twisted his, his comment yeah. to, hey, maybe we should just go ahead and infuse bias into, into AI. <laughs> The one point that you just brought ended there with was uh, that yes, AI can scale, but also AI can uh, change quickly versus yeah. uh, re-educating the surgical community about where patients are going is an extremely laborious process and uh, currently in, in particularly in today's healthcare system. Uh, okay, thanks, Lona. Uh, he just responded, yes, you did twist my, my comment. All right, um, so I think we have time for one more Maybe two more questions, depends upon how quickly we can do this. Um, okay, so what do you think? Should we just think now about AI just augmenting our other work for now until it gets to a point where, you know, it's it's ready for prime time? It is, I mean, IA can be used for, AI can be used for prime time now. It just has to be used appropriately. Um, and I think it's a powerful tool. Like, like I said, I mean, I, I would never want to give up let's say a tissue sealing device in the operating room because it, it's really useful. Um, I think it just means we need to pay more attention to the craft of AI, sort of, you know, the, the design thinking around it and, and contextualizing it in an appropriate way. I do think that in, in general, using AI to do sort of more mundane tasks that don't have potentially, you know, dire consequences is probably, a, a, a safer way to use AI right now. So as we talked about, if it's just transcribing um, a conversation uh, and then just make it easier for a human to review that conversation and not maybe spend a couple hours when he or she goes home typing in the HR, I think that's a good use of AI. Um, so yes, in general, I'd say using it more for logistical or sort of operational efficiencies is probably a safer place to use it. For clinical decision support, you know, the stakes are higher. Um, and um, I do think that what that means is that we have to be more careful. Great. Well, I think that's a great point to end on. We're, we're just about out of time. I think I asked you one more question. Uh, this is such a great topic. There's so much to talk about that will go over our a lot of time. So thank you very much, Dr. Huang. We really appreciate your spending time with us and sharing your expertise.